the Dunkin' Showroom, I'm Longevity John. A lot of you know who I am. A lot of you know who Dr. Bill Coates is. You might not know the two of us together, but I went in to get, um, I've always been a, a, a supporter of, of uh, cannabis, and uh, I, was, I heard that I would be able to get a license once if I had gone up to Dr. Bill, and, and he heard what, I, what my, my ailments were, that he might be able to help me out and write his prescription. Well, after talking with him for 20 minutes, uh, he basically said I had MS. And that explained to me for 25 years of my life what had been going on that I hadn't realized. Little things would come and then they would go. Then they would come and they would go. And I never quite understood what was going on. And just a year prior to that, I'd been noticing a lot of little things that I didn't want to admit to. But when I went in, it was quite a shock to find out that, what, you've got MS? So I had the opportunity of meeting Coco Jones right afterwards because I knew she had it. And she was my first person that I confided in and we, we shared that. And, she has a journey that she's going on too. And as I go through life, I find out more and more people uh, have that thing called MS. And we're trying not to own it. We're trying to figure out ways to, to work with it and make it uh, just a part of my life, not, not the controller of my life. Through that, I was able to find out about hyperbaric oxygen. I was find out about a whole bunch of things. And today, the whole idea of integrative, integrative medicine, this gentleman here, is one of the greatest purveyors in the world of what's going on with that. He's doing conferences around the world. And there's a reason, because I think they have, through a group of people, we've discovered ways to make life much easier for us and to quite understand it. So please, Mr. Bill Code, Dr. Bill Code. Thanks, John. And I'll just reiterate his, you know, thanks for coming out on Mother's Day. Um, it's my first Mother's Day without my mom. At at almost 93, she passed away in mid-April. And so I will dedicate part of this to her. She lived in the Valley a long time and, of course, was a major supporter. I'm really lucky to have my wife, Denise, here with me today. And uh, it's 44 years we've been married in June this year. And, of course, that's been an, that's a relative accomplishment these days. I get that. Because um, that's the secret of happiness is marry the right person, one of the biggest pieces anyway. So... What I would like to do today and, and is talk a little bit about my book. Uh, you know, we've, we've got some with us, of course, because I felt compelled to write this book. I hadn't written one for about 12 years. When I finished that one 12 years ago called Winning the Pain Game, I thought I was probably done writing books because I was still having significant challenges cognitively and thinking and so on because uh, my own MS was diagnosed 22 years ago, 22 and a half. And that's what took me out of the operating room, my time in anesthesiology, some 20 plus years. And just to fill in some of the bits you may not know, I, I did four years of family practice in Hudson Bay, Saskatchewan, which is on the railroad line up to Churchill. And then I went back and did anesthesia and neurosciences and a fair bit of critical care and chronic pain work. And that's the pieces that have kind of followed me on. I did not expect to get my own neurodegenerative disease. It was a big chew accepting the word neurodegenerative in oneself, as any of you might guess, but many of us have them. And as we get older, more of them crop up. It's a huge deal to get any issue with the brain because for many years, physicians felt and neuroscientists even felt that there wasn't anything we could do for the brain. But in the decade of the brain, which is the 1990s, and most of you will at least remember parts of that, um, we decided that the brain could heal, and it can. And it's very good at healing, and it's very good at adapting to challenges, so-called neuroplasticity. And now we know some techniques in our own personal toolbox that we can make those pieces happen better. So the concept of the book was to write it so that the layperson could understand it and deal with it themselves. I've now over 40 years practicing medicine. It goes by really quickly, uh, as you might guess. And in that time, it completely changed sort of my premise of how to practice medicine. I mean, I started out like everybody else. Diagnosis, that's the key. You get the diagnosis. Then you, or better yet, your pharmacist can say the right single drug to get that disease better and life is good, but it mostly doesn't work. Most of you now know that most of those drugs are just literally band-aids in the system, might cover up some of the symptoms for you, 
or like the antidepressants, it'll certainly make you feel different, but the data on antidepressants is now out. It's 0.2% better than placebo, which means it doesn't work any better than placebo, really. And so, yes, they'll make the brain feel different, but unfortunately they also put you at relative more risk of suicide and homicide, which is pretty hard to dispel in our current society. So to take it from there. So mental health, of course, is a significant piece of the book. I mean, I've had a 20-year journey myself of being on antidepressants. I haven't been on it for probably 15 years now. Don't expect a need to go back because there's other methods that work better. And maybe that helps tie in all parts of the book because the concept of inflammation, which is what exactly depression is, it's the brain on fire. Some of you probably saw the Times Magazine picture a few years ago with the brain with fire coming out of it to demonstrate that. Because inflammation, when it affects the brain, we get mood changes. And that can be erratic in some ways, meaning the so-called waxing and waning or bipolar type, uh, or it can be you know, only sort of downhill. But I have a great empathy for all those issues, having had those ones myself. Um, and working forward. And any brain injury, whether it's MS or, or traumatic brain injury or concussion um, or post-stroke, all of those people are more vulnerable to injury of the brain, inflammation of the brain, and therefore depression. The other piece that became very obvious to me over time is the cognitive loss, okay? And some of you might have MS or know someone with MS. It's a part that you don't see on the outside, of course, because you can't see someone who's cognitively challenged. And if they're good at hiding it, and most of us are, you may not know it from your occasional interactions. But trust me, those people know that they're struggling cognitively with their thinking apparatus, whether it's short-term memory or any variation thereof. Cognitive loss is something that was very huge for me, and it was one of the main reasons I had to leave the operating room, because you need to be sharp, you need to be able to multitask, and when those aren't there, you're not safe, simply. So that was one reason. I worked four years in the Duncan Hospital, and prior to that I was at the University of Saskatchewan on faculty, teaching anesthesiology residents and doing my own sort of brain research on how pieces went, including four years with a stroke research team. So that all tied together because I eventually realized that stroke and MS are close cousins. This may be new ground for you, but I believe that most MS is miniature strokes. Same as migraine headaches. Over half of those people have microembolic injury or miniature strokes when they get their headache. And of course, MS people, 70% of them have headaches, and you know, the beat goes on. I spent some time in the, in the books on those chapters. Recently, there was a discussion point about uh, MS and, and the new drug option and so on, and so I went to the major countries, English speaking, that talk about MS on their website for their society for the country, the National Youth MS one in the US, the one in Australia, the one in the United Kingdom. Each of those described MS just the way I would like it thought of by our own neurologists in that it's a major inflammation in a part of the brain, it's a leakiness of the blood-brain blood -brain barrier, and then they leave it at that. Whereas our Canadian site, unfortunately, still says this is an autoimmune illness. It's not, okay? There is many autoimmune illnesses, and I'm happy to address those if people want to ask about them today because they have a similar solution, not exactly the same, but there's a similar solution for each of those 400 uh, issues, and it, it goes down to the gut well-being, I think. Um, but I don't believe MS is in that group. The immune system is very late to the table in MS, and that's why now after 25, 30 years of using these very expensive drugs, 30 to 50,000 a year, we know that, yes, they change the picture on the MRI, but they do not change your onset of disability in your life path at all. So that's pretty humbling and so on. I mean, I can write several thousand dollars worth of prescription if I see people. I choose not to. 
for the simple reason that they would be much better off with supplements, exercise, and maybe extra oxygen and all these other pieces than they would be with those crazy drugs. But the system doesn't change easily or quickly. And I'm not a very patient guy. I know some of you aren't either. I suspect there's a modest number in the room of so-called early adapters. So the early adapters are the people that, about 5% of the population, that they change to new ideas quicker and easier than the rest. And that's all I could ask. If, if my book could even get around to most of the early adapters, that would be good. I think it'll get talked about a lot. I'm hopeful that it, it might make it in a major way. We're into three languages now, we'll be in four soon. Because my goal is to get this into people's hands because knowledge is power, okay? And that's what we can do. So what I'd like to do today, just to tell you about what we're up to, is I want you to ask your own questions, okay? So think of your questions, and I'll do my best to answer them. If I can't answer them, I'll be honest and say, well, I don't know. But I might have some suggestions where to look. Because if you ask your questions, then you're much more engaged in the discussion than me just standing up here and, and uh, handing out words or lecturing or whatever one wants to call it. We are taping this as, w as well, and happily, John is extremely good at making that into a YouTube option. And I don't think the cameras will be on the individuals anyway. We'll look after your privacy because I respect that. In many cases, if we haven't recorded the question, I may repeat it for that simple reason. Um, so prior to that, I'm going to give you four items in the book which may be relatively new to many of you, not all of you, because I recognize some faces in the room. But these are pieces that have come to pass. They have literature research behind them in virtually all cases to a major degree. But of course, as we know now, it takes 17 years before something is proven and confirmed in the literature printed, in the science literature, 17 years before it might become medical practice. Okay? So, I, I told you before, I'm not very patient, and I expect some of you don't want to wait the whole 17 years if you can bypass it in the first place. So, in those four things, you know, John already mentioned cannabis. Um, we've had medical cannabis in Canada since 2001. It probably wasn't until about 2007 or 8 that I started to use it more, mostly through close contacts and friends who had found it very useful in their pain journey. So I started to look more into it and now have seen and helped many people get their so-called medical document which means that you can have medical cannabis. And of course, as you all know, in October last year, we now had the recreational option. Although it's not super available in all parts of BC, I think it's, so far it's only in Kamloops, as far as the store you can walk into, but maybe that will one day change. Um, I hope so. But medical cannabis, cannabis has been huge. I mean, we've had a, a prescription drug in Canada for about 15 years called Sativex, S-A-T-I-V-E-X. So that's a little spray under the tongue. And that's what some people use when they travel out of country, you know, because it's a little tricky to take your cannabis with you out of country, especially south of the border. But the prescription one is probably better tolerated. I still don't bring it up directly necessarily because I'm not sure everybody is on that same page. But cannabis is tremendous for MS people, for example, because it'll handle several different items for them. It often will help with the pain of headaches. Remember I said there was lots of migraine headaches in MS patients. It'll help a lot with the neuropathic or shooting electrical type pains, which happen lots in MS, as in any brain injury type individual, potentially. And it's very good for the muscle spasms of MS, which are horrendous. And it's very good at the sleep patterns those challenges with sleep, and MS is one of those. I mention in the book why proper, optimal, deep sleep without pharmaceutical intervention is necessary because most of the pharmaceuticals take away the natural sleep. If you get natural deep sleep, when you're in that phase at night, the brain cleans itself. You could say it does brainwash it, okay? But what it does is it kind of squeezes itself like a sponge, pushes out all the fluid in around the pathways into the cerebral spinal fluid, and eventually they get out the venous system and out the body. If you don't do that squeeze at night because you're wrecking your sleep from any host of troubles, 
then those toxins persist and the brain won't work as well. The other important piece about the brain is it is only 2% of our body weight, 2%. But it needs 20% of the body's blood flow. Why? Because it's a huge oxygen-hungry tissue. There is no tissue in the body except maybe the heart that needs that much energy. So why would the energy part be important? The energy part is important because that's where thinking comes from. That's where the action of the neuron happens. The other piece I want to introduce you, because it's probably sort of new ground, is the sleeping neuron. So someone has a stroke, all right? So a part of the vessel to part of their brain is blocked off, and the blood flow is dramatically shut off in the short term. And those people, maybe they lose their speech, maybe they lose one side, and if they're fortunate, it comes back. Almost all of that brain tissue supplied by that blood vessel does not die. It's more what we call a sleeping neuron. The sleeping neuron means it has enough oxygen to stay alive, because that's not very much, okay? But not enough to be actively working. So anytime you can change that whole scenario, you start to improve blood flow, and secondarily, the body will rebuild the blood vessels to that area, so those borderline places. And to do that, the most powerful tool is probably hyperbaric oxygen, okay? So through a question of circumstances four and a half years ago, the oxygen units that were in Victoria moved to a farm and then they moved to our farm. So we've had them a little over four years and I've now done over 400 treatments in them and a number of other people do. I don't run them. Um, that would be risky. The fellow and physician, Prince George, that ran some, he lost his license. So I didn't want to go down that path. So I have Andrew Patterson runs them and he's a very well-trained guy because he ran these issues over in the North Sea of oil and the undersea divers and to major depths. It's a much more compli complicated scenario than the ones we run at the farm. And he runs them very safely because just as that in the UK in the 1980s, my favorite mentor of all, Philip James, who wrote the Oxygen in the Brain book, The Journey of Our Lifetime, realized that oxygen was the cornerstone of recovery from MS, stroke, and a whole host of things, and especially traumatic brain injury or multiple concussions. So we haven't talked any treatments for that before, but it works. And it's worked and it's documented in the, in the book. Um, We'll talk about other options for oxygen, but the hyperbaric is the best way to start. We know that if you do 20 treatments over the course of four to six weeks, so that'd be one a day on average, then you're able to do several things in the body. First of all, many pieces start to wake up and recover, and people sometimes will have increased mobility, they'll have better cognitive thought, it may break their migraine headache, which you know I use it for from time to time. But the good feature is it will also boost your personal stem cells six to eight times. So I'd rather spend a couple thousand on doing my stem cells, personal ones here in the valley, than going down to California, having my fat taken out for a bit and, and uh, spun down, and then they put the stem cells back into the intravenous, and they may or may not get success. I'd rather do the ones I have internally. You can also boost them with photobiomodulation, which G Genoa Laser Therapy Center can do, so I'm very happy that we've now got, you know, three modalities. We'll get to the other one in a minute. In the valley here that are making this a destination center. You folks are fortunate, I think, because you live here. And I know I'm fortunate to live here, partly because of those and partly because it's the warmest mean temperature in Canada. And, and uh, I'm from the prairies. And I was just back to visit. We drove out to Winnipeg and back on a book tour. And uh, it's a long ways, actually. It's further than I remembered it 20 years ago. Funny how that works. Yeah, a big sky country is awesome, and the people are fabulous. Maybe because I'm of that kith and kin, I don't know, but I like prairie people. They're easy to get along with. They're down to earth, practical. Let's get to the root of the problem and solve it. And sometimes that's a collegial thing. 
It's a little hard to, harder to do as a physician or a farmer out in BC, I found. Everybody's kind of independent out here. They can live their own life because they don't have to support each other in a driving snowstorm. That's my theory, anyway. <laughs> so those parts, pieces aside, oxygen is a very critical piece to reverse things. So the other change that's happened in the last 20 or so years, most of you have now seen an oxygen concentrator, OK? So you plug it in your wall. It's the size, roughly, of that speaker, although it can be a third the size of the speaker, depending which one it is. The one I take routinely on airplanes is about a third that size. The one I use at home for exercise is about that size, and it makes a fair bit of noise, so I put it in a separate room, but I use it when I exercise on my elliptical. That's a win-win. Exercise is the very best value in medicine without question. Almost all of us can afford it, and almost all of us can do it. If you can't do it, there's a chapter on exercise, but I also talk about the vibration machines, and that should be in all of our stroke centers, it should be recovery centers, it should be in all of our MS recovery centers, because it fires all of the motor pathways of the body and will allow fitness to start to occur and recur. So maybe you haven't been sending messages down that leg because of your stroke or your MS, but this will fire the muscles anyway. So they'll start to rejuvenate, because the muscles have been fine all along, it's just the messages to them that have been compromised, okay? So exercise is a powerful tool. If you do it while you're breathing extra oxygen, so I put on a, they call it an EWAT mask, exercise while oxygen training, okay? And it's a, fact, a reasonably good fitting mask with a plastic bag type thing in front of it, with a fairly large tube. That allows you to breathe in almost 70% oxygen, okay, which is quite outstanding. That alone will boost your circulating dissolved oxygen four to five times. Not quite the 15 times that you were going to get in the oxygen chamber, but certainly way better than nothing, all right? There's a brilliant article written by Dr. John West. I think he's originally out of Australia, but now he's a professor emeritus at San Diego. He was in his mid-80s now. He wrote an article in the New England Journal about two years ago, almost, almost two years now, talk, and I talk about it in the book because it's critical. He talked about the, the several million people in the world that live at high altitudes. They don't function as well or optimally. So the part about that is some oxygen can make a big difference. For example, if you test the kids in a high school up at super high altitude, they will not perform as well. However, if you give the room oxygen conditioning, which is very much like air conditioning, and move it up to 28% from the 21 we're at currently, all of them perform better. In fact, if you take one of those teenage students and give them this good-fitting mask I talked about with the non-rebreathing portion in it, and you put in an appropriate flow, one minute of use will improve that teenager's brain function for 24 hours. So there's a helpful tip for the kids going off for their exam or whatever they're up to, because it makes that big a difference. The other subtlety I talk about with regard to that is when we lay flat, and most of us sleep laying flat, not everybody, but most of us. When we lay flat, our oxygenation goes down some. And that's not surprising because the weight of our intestines and guts comes up against the diaphragm and the oxygen ventilation perfusion is what we call it, but it means the ability of oxygen to transmit into the blood coming from the heart. So not as much gets into it, and so we have a relative lowering of the available oxygen at night. Okay? So that's something that one of my benefits, what I like to do, and especially critical when I travel, is I use oxygen at night to supplement what's in the room. And that's became incredibly important. Denise and I were lucky enough to go to uh, Cuenca, Ecuador for two weeks last year on our way to Cusco, which is of course the jumping off point for Machu Picchu in Peru. And we took a spare one. I didn't just take mine. I borrowed a friend's for Denise because her first two days at altitude were not that pleasant. In fact, if you're unlucky and get altitude sickness and nobody can predict if you're going to get it or not, you got to go down the mountain, which kind of spoils your whole trip and ends it right away. And it's always in the first day or two. It's not in the fourth or fifth day, usually. So 
that just gives you an idea of the power of oxygen. Now, how many people in here have been in a hyperbaric, uh, hyperbaric chamber? Okay. So uh, I was asking that for a tricky reason. How many of you have flown in a jet airplane? Okay. So that is a hyperbaric chamber. You didn't realize it, but of course you're flying at 38, 40,000 feet, and it's pressurized to about eight and a half. All right. If you're in a new Dreamliner, you're happily a little luckier. It's pressurized to six and a half thousand feet. So if you're doing your th thinking, you've realized that the Dreamliner has more oxygen available to people on board. Okay. There's another interesting wrinkle I learned from my mentor uh, in Scotland, Philip James. I mentioned him earlier, Professor James, is that usually pilots are rewarded for using less fuel. So pilots aren't stupid people. And so they tend to fly higher than recommended. And that's cool because it saves fuel. They're higher. The only kicker for you is you're getting even a little less oxygen than you thought you were. Now, if he asked for it, he or she asked for it as a pilot for my oxygen because they weren't thinking clearly, I'd be no problem. I would like the pilot to do well and think well while they're flying. And I would suggest that now we know that especially the pilots that go up and down frequently have a whole host of health problems. And I suspect at least part of that isn't, it isn't all, I don't think, to the radiation. I think it's due to the intermittent recurring slightly hypoxic events. Because that's hard on body tissues. It isn't acutely a problem when you get the lower the oxygen, but as soon as you add back in normal oxygen, then you get superoxide radicals released. So let's dispel that myth while we're talking about it. Because some people will say, well, too much oxygen, it's going to injure your brain, it's going to injure all your tissues. Not true. It's almost always a complete myth. Even the one that we talk about in newborns and prematures, because everybody's worried that they'll get retrolental fibroplasia. That's a fancy name for eye injury to the premature or the newborn infant. And it's due to oxygen, but it's only due to oxygen if you take the higher oxygen that they were needed to treat and you taper it off immediately. Much better if you taper it off one or three days. And if you do that, you'll get no eye injury. But the fear factors become so strong that the pediatricians have mounted a wall, and now the resuscitation of newborn and prematures in this country and in the United Kingdom is done on room air, which is an absolute insane approach, I would suggest, at the same rate, at the same time, the rate of cerebral palsy has gone up at the same rate that the use of oxygen has gone down because you're injuring the brain by not giving it enough when it critically needs it to recover. So when I resuscitated, I want people to use extra oxygen. It's been in our premise a long time. The other thing now they do is they say, well, if you're an old person, I'm 65, so if you're an old person, you don't need as much oxygen on your pulse oximeter. Pulse oximeter is a little clip on a fingertip. Um, you're pretty happy if it's 98, 99, and I would be too. If it's 92, then you're okay, because you're an old person. You don't need extra oxygen. And that's just absolute nonsense, I think. In fact, I know for a fact. The interesting thing that most of our medical people have forgotten, because it isn't taught well enough in medical school, is that the oxygen, yes, it's carried around by the hemoglobin, okay, the iron-containing component in your red blood cells. But when it reaches the part of the body where it's needed, it has to leave that hemoglobin. It has to diffuse down a cascade of higher pressure to lower pressure to get into the cells. So it has to leave the red blood cell, travel through the fluid or plasma, through the endothelium or the, the membrane of the blood vessel, and then partly through the fluid to get to the cells it's going to reach. So when you're at 99% saturated on your pulse oximeter, it gets to the brain and it could have about a concentration of about 120 millimeters of mercury. So pretty good. Pretty good to go down that cascade so that all the cells out here are getting enough oxygen. And therefore, Working, not sleeping neurons, but working neurons. However, if you're down at 92%, you're 
you only have 60 millimeters of mercury of oxygen. So now the risk of your cascade getting down to some of those cells, it isn't going to work. They're going to shut down. They're not dead, but they're going to go sleep. So they're not functioning for us in a cognitive manner. So learning those principles from Dr. James primarily, and my 400 plus treatments in hyperbaric oxygen, allowed me enough brain cognitive recovery to write the book. And I couldn't have done it without it. There's no question about it. And I will use oxygen the rest of my life in addition, because it makes for a better quality of life, a better thinking quality of life. I really liked, and I put it in the last quote in the last chapter on hyperbaric oxygen, Edward Teller. So he was a famous astrophysicist, right? And he got into it because of his wife. His wife had terrible lung disease, and they told her she's got two or three months to live. And his colleague, physician Dr. Neubauer in Florida said, you might try hyperbaric oxygen for her. So he bought one, he used it, and she lived well with a pretty decent quality of life for five years. So after medicine had washed their hands, which it does do, and they do it very quickly in brain injuries and brain problems, they say, well, there's nothing more we can do for you. Go home and live with it. They might see you once a year, because happily as they watch you slide down your hill, you know, they get the same payment for reviewing you once a year. That's ironically why it's once a year and it's not every 11 months, trust me. Okay, so the oxygen is a big piece to maintaining the brain, maintaining the cognitive function. And Edward Teller worked until he was 95. And he said, you don't need extra oxygen if you're not gonna use your brain, okay? But he chose to use it six days a week so he could continue to work all the days of his life. So you get to choose if you want it or not. Me, I really kind of like using it. Um, it it's generally been good to me and, and it's worth maintaining. So I think we've kind of talked a lot about oxygen. I'm sure that's created a few questions among you and that's great, we're gonna get to those in a minute. Um, I went pretty quickly by cannabis, but I'm in a part of the world, British Columbia, that. Cannabis is better known here than anywhere else, probably. I spent 50 pages in the book, the only super long chapter, talking about cannabis because there's an awful lot of misrepresentation. There's a lot of statements by my colleagues saying that there isn't any evidence for this, and that's just nonsense. Almost all the evidence by virtue of where the laws existed were done in Israel and Italy and other parts of the world outside Canada and the United States because we had huge laws making it extremely difficult to research cannabis in a lab in North America. So it just didn't happen since about 1935, 37, when they had the completely scurrilous story in Congress that it was the most violence producing drug on the planet, which wasn't true, but it sure changed things for over nearly 100 years. So now that we've got it back as an option, the one-to-one -one is, is the favorite to start for the cannabis naive because it's one part THC, one part CBD. If your short course in cannabis is needed, the T of THD stands for trippy. It's the one that gives you the trippy piece. That's the one that gave everybody the so-called recreational cannabis high. And the recreational cannabis from the time I started university, which is the early 70s, to now, you know, went from several percent THC to probably up to 30%. Correspondingly, whenever you do a plant, and Denise and I have had a you know, major organic vegetable, so we know a bit about farming and growing plants, every time you breed for one trait, usually the other trait goes down. So the CBD component went down that whole time. And yet if you do a one-to-one -one mixture, the CBD to a great degree takes away some of that nasty trippiness and has its own relative benefits as well. Pure CBD doesn't necessarily solve all your problems, although it's getting promoted a lot as such, because there's, of all the United States, 50 states, 30 of them now have medical cannabis. There's another 10 or 15 will permit CBD, okay? But they're very, very concerned about THC because of their own old manner of thinking. So if you're going to treat pain, often you can do pretty well with the one-to-one -one combo if it isn't enough then you should go to four parts THC and one part CBD. And that is one of the best things known for chronic pain 
nerve-induced pain, diabetic neuropathy, the list goes on and on. In fact, you know, I've helped now probably over 2,000 people, most of them with chronic pain, a few with epilepsy and other things, but make a big difference in their life and often get off almost all other medications. And they stay off them. I've even seen it take people that were using alcohol, alcohol in excess to control their pain. It's a painkiller, a really lousy one, but it's used a lot because it's accepted in our society. They usually quit the booze completely too within six, 12 months because they don't need it anymore, happily. So um, the fourth item I wanted to talk about a bit was the gut-brain axis, okay? So most of you now know that there's a tremendous interaction and communication between the gut and the brain. So all of those feelings you've heard since you were a kid that go with your gut feeling had a lot more validity than we thought, okay? It's difficult, but if you read Candace Pert's book called Molecules of Emotion, she talks about there, about the feelings and the wisdom and the knowledge, for example, inside your knee. I mean, we've put it all into the brain and the mind, but that's our oversimplification so we can handle it. But those molecules of emotion and interaction are throughout the body. But let's move back to the gut itself. So the gut itself produces 70% of our serotonin, okay? Serotonin is a major feel-good hormone, especially for women. It produces half of our dopamine, which is a kind of major feel-good hormone for men. So recognize then that the gut does half or more than half of those neurotransmitters, okay? So those neurotransmitters, of course, are the communication method between the neurons and so on. But as our understanding of those has improved, and we've started to understand now why the dopamine might be in excess, and now we're getting psychosis, okay, then we know how to solve that because we can take away the thing that's producing too much dopamine or we can improve the lot of the enzyme that moves it from dopamine over to noradrenaline or norepinephrine, both of which are really important for brain function, including depression and bipolar problems and so on. So as we mapped out those pieces and we've come to understand them better, we're much more capable of doing something about it. So the gut itself, okay, so the gut has a huge amount of surface area inside it. If you take all of the, well, we've sort of got shag carpet here, but you know, most of you are old enough to remember what shag carpet was. It stood up an inch or two long and, and then it laid down and it, it looked pretty dreadful once it was really old. but. Uh, it's a nice example for the villi in the gut, okay? So there's all these villi standing up from the wall of the gut. On each of those villi is a bunch of microvilli, okay? Those are miniature versions of the same thing all the way up and down my fingers, which are replicating the, uh, the villi. So those microvilli and villi in that 15, 20 feet of small bowel is equivalent to a football field. This is handy because it works for a soccer field and. Europe and it works for a football field here, but a big surface area. So in that whole surface area, the health and well-being of the gut lining really matters, okay? Oh yeah, it needs oxygen. Can't go away from that. And um, many of you have heard of ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. Before they do surgery now, if they can at the Mayo Clinic, they will give people hyperbaric oxygen. So the people needing to go on to surgery has been reduced by 70%, okay? So a powerful tool for the gut. So that'll give you some inclination of what it might do for the brain too. So within those microvilli, that whole surface area, it's a team approach. It's the cells lining the wall, which are produced by our cells, that single cell lining, and then it's the blood vessel system so that things are absorbed through that lining and get into the bloodstream. Joining those individual cells is the so-called uh, tight junctions. So think of little building blocks or glue blocks between those cells to make everything fit well. And the other part of forming that healthy is having normal, healthy, particular bacteria which work in conjunction. They help with the mucus production, they live well with the mucus production, and they work as a team to improve the well-being of that wall the whole time. So if you get unhealthy cells there, things don't do as good. 
A classic example you all know is C. diff, okay? Most people can't absorb hardly anything because C. difficile has taken over all that area that was by the normal healthy bacteria team and replaced it with their Clostridium version making of that group, C. diff. So the other component that each of these do by this lining of the gut, the gut is our major interaction with the outside world. Everything that we eat or drink goes through the gut. And that's why 70, 80% of our whole immune system is based in the gut. And if you can keep that immune system healthy, then you will do much better, you get sick much less often, and if you can keep the lining sealed into the gut so that it's just the things that we want to go through, the amino acids we want to go through, then everything stays healthy. However, if you something comes along, and my favorite example, of course, is gluten. They did a nice study a couple of years ago in healthy young people. Everywhere I go, there's more young people, but these were really young. They were in their 20s and 30s. So they did an uh, endoscopy. So they looked down with a scope at their gut. They confirmed that these were normal, healthy people. They didn't have any gut inflammation. Then they gave them a gluten-based meal, might have been a slice of bread, but the same deal. And they looked down again. And in all 200 subjects, they all now had gut inflammation. So what's the downside of that gut inflammation? Gut inflammation, you know what it is. If I hit my thumb with a hammer, it gets red, swollen, hot, and pain or loss of function. Well, the same thing happens with the gut cell lining. The gut cell lining gets inflamed. The tight junctions that were sealing things together gets weakened. And now you get gaps or holes in the gut. Colloquial term is leaky gut, which is quite a good one. And now pieces of protein that weren't supposed to, and gluten would be one of these, but there'd be lots of other proteins, and that's why your food sensitivities start to go up and up and up. Because when these pieces of protein leak through into the bloodstream, your innate immune system attacks them, because these are foreign proteins. They're not where they're supposed to be. Secondary to that, it's not uncommon, something called molecular mimicry occurs, and now the body's immune system thinks that that protein that leaked through the gut, my example is gluten, but there's many others that do it, now looks like a tissue in the body. Now you've got Hashimoto's thyroiditis, and you've got an autoimmune disease, or now you've got psoriasis, now you've got eczema, now you've got rheumatoid arthritis, and probably even osteoarthritis, okay? So that's the cascade that you need to fix. So how can you fix it? Well, many of you will be fortunate and you can fix it by changing what you eat and what you drink. So you want to drink healthy water, not super duper chlorinated, because what does chlorination do? It kills bacteria. Remember, we want a happy team here. There's some 10 trillion bacteria within us. Most of them are in the large bowel, but they're all the way from the lips to the back end, bottom end, okay? And we want the healthy, good guys working for us and not the not-so-healthy, not-so-good guys working against our gingivitis, our gum problem, or anything else on the way down. So as we try to improve that, we talked about the water, and I would also like you to dramatically increase the diversity in your diet. And I aim now for 50 different foods per week. It takes a bit of doing. I got a couple friends, I don't, they don't have me there, but these guys were really into juicing and all these other things. He came back to me the, a few days later and a big smile on his face said, I'm at 50, Bill, which was awesome. There's no question. And they helped me out getting to 50 because they make a juice drink that's usually got about 13 things in it I might not drink otherwise. So that helps me on my way to 50 as well. And you get one for coffee and you get one for tea. Uh, I guess you'd get one for milk if you're doing that. But you wouldn't get extra ones for the double-doubles or anything like that. It just doesn't work quite that good, okay? Or different kinds of teas. Still, tea is one, unless it's herbals, and then you're probably going to move up another one. That's good. By having that diversity, you get a huge, healthy, broad-spectrum diversity of the gut bacteria within you. And that makes it much, much less likely that some of the not so friendly guys, C. difficile, some of the bad strains, bad strains of E. coli or um, Shigella, 
or Campylobacter, any of the other nasty bacterias that could aggravate the things and give you so-called food poisoning. So by that diversity, you're doing much better. Probiotics are pretty good, they're pretty useful. The downside about probiotics, it's much better if you can use a probiotic food. That might be kefir, might be yogurt, or even if you're dairy-free, you can do coconut yogurt, uh, kombucha, kimchi, popular in Korea, and as well as sauerkraut, you know, popular in parts of Europe. Because each of those are high in particular healthy bacteria which do well for you. And those are better often as a probiotic than the ones we swallow, because think about how we make the ones that we swallow. I mean, this has to be economic. They probably started out with a really good culture group from a human and cultured all of those bacteria up in a nice friendly vat, okay, would had good growing conditions and they could do reproduction after reproduction after reproduction. Because remember, you're trying to go from a small thing to a lot of them so you can sell them. Makes sense. The downside is of all those changes, of all those generations, hundreds and thousands of generations, they've got their food supply nearby and they lose most of their normal wildness. Okay? So they just, be, and so almost invariably, a week or two after you quit taking that probiotic, there is nothing in your gut because they weren't able to cling on to and become part of the team as much. So that's why prebiotics can be better. Prebiotics or chicory root uh, or different ones will support often different groups of bacteria. But that's what the very different foods are doing. You're relying on the slightly different fiber or other nuances within that food to support a particular subset of different bacteria within you. And the advantage of 50 is, I cannot tell, nor can you, nor can a gastroenterologist or a microbiologist tell which ones are best for you as an individual, because that will vary. There will be a lot of crossover. Apparently, if you have a dog in your family, in your household, you'll have even more crossover, and you'll share a lot of the same microbiome. That's why if you're going to go for a donor, that's probably not the very best place to go, because you won't get as much variety and nuances of what might be optimal for you. So if those aren't enough for your feature or for your own individual well-being of your gut and therefore all these other challenges that were aggravated because of it, you can then go for gut floral transplant. Okay? So that's the name that we coined about a year and a half ago. That's the name I use in my book. I initially went over to the United Kingdom to the Taymount Clinic, T-A-Y-M-O-U-N-T, because Glenn Taylor and, and uh, his spouse had the word mountain in it. Anyway, they called it the Taymount Clinic, and I went there for my gut floral transplant. At that time, they were using the non-optimal marketing name, fecal microbial transplant, or FMT. FMT doesn't sound too bad, but the word fecal really gets people in a knot. And, uh, it wasn't good marketing when they decided that. I don't think there was any marketing people in the room when they dreamt that term up 30 years ago. Originally coined and used a great deal. I mean, it's not brand new. The yellow soup of the Chinese four to 5,000 years ago probably contained components of that in it, all right? But, so when I went over there, before I went, I had to do about a month of a, some pretty significant magnesium to help clean the gut. I went down to Victoria. I didn't want to have my local friends here doing the col colonic irrigation. I thought that was hard on them and maybe me too. So I went to Victoria for my colonic irrigation and then I went over to the UK for my two weeks of, of uh, GFT. So on the first day they did one more colonic and that was clean enough so then they give you the first implant. The first implants maybe 20, 30 cc's which has been accepted by really healthy, slim donors and each of those are important. I'll talk a bit more about them in a minute. And then the goal is to retain that for as long as you can until I do another one the next morning. Um, even if you hold it for an hour, you're getting about 80% benefit from it. So it's pretty good. And usually by the time they've positioned you and stuff, that's taken nearly an hour because you're trying to get it to move from the rectum all the way up the uh, descending colon, across the transverse colon. This is a large bowel we're talking about and down to the other part where the appendix is, okay? or the item, ileocecal valve. So 
and the next day they did another go around next day and of course five different donors that week weekend off and then five different donors the second week so that was their routine by that time they'd done 30,000 implants so they had modest modest experience they're now their most experienced in the world by far um, and by the end middle of the second week I was pretty pleased because my fatigue had improved some but my mental clarity was quite a lot better first thing in the morning. I mean, I had been a morning person till or my early 40s when I started to develop the signs of MS that I couldn't deny or ignore anymore. Because uh, denial is a powerful place to live. I mean, John talked about his own denial of some 25 years, and we don't know what it is, and so we deny it. It's just it's not a good day or whatever. So, so I was quite delighted to wake up in the morning, 6.37, I'm now only two weeks away from time zone here, so that's not too bad, and my brain was clear, and I could write notes and do things that I could only usually do for an hour or two window per day, so that time was starting to extend. And some of the other benefits, I think, have continued to recur. They sent some samples home with me, or implants, they routinely do. I send two home with you. You can purchase more once you've been through their system. And so, at that time, Denise and I started to talk about it, and so we moved forward with it gradually, slowly, and with the Genoa Laser, or sorry, Genoa Integrative Health Center, which encompasses Genoa Laser Therapy, and now the facility that's under Denise's auspices, that's a lot better if the doc wants to maintain his license, probably, um, under Denise's auspices is in that same building, you know, just up in Gibbons Road, approximately across from the hospital, and shares the same parking lot with many of the specials that you've seen. Bit of a hard chew for them, but they were quite on board once we just said that we would fix their pavement as we made it amenable to ours. Yeah. I know how docs think. I mean, I've been around them a long time. So with those pieces in place, so since July last year, we've been doing implantation here with exactly the same pattern and exactly the same source of implants as the UK because we have them shipped over here. They're shipped over as high-end probiotics, which is exactly what they are, okay? And before you get all concerned and worried about this poop implant, let me tell you what happens. So they have the healthy donors, and most of them are either uh, through an exercise club or they're through a volunteer fire department. So these are very fit people and their spouses, and they are credited on how diverse their gut flora is. The ones that work hard at the 50 times, 50 different foods a week, they usually win the prize of the month. The prize of the month is a 50 pound, you know, go and eat at a restaurant sort of certificate, but it's quite a rivalry among them. What drives them forward is not the few pounds that, or dollars that they get for payment, but they get the stories of people that they've helped. So that's why they do it. And now the same clinic in the UK is now under major, um, revision and being looked at, they will now have to hire a physician on board because it's becoming quite a medical thing now in the UK and parts of the world. And so probably by the end of the summer or fall, they will be the only private facility in the world recognized medically to provide gut floral transplant implants, okay? So right from the get-go, because Glenn Taylor is a major microbiologist, very, very well informed, very well studied, and his wife is a naturopath, Enid. And so they put the system together. They, right from the get-go, wanted safety to be number one. So before they will accept a donor, they get their historical story. They need to be healthy people. They need not to have any major offending things ongoing. And they will test them for all the viruses known for man at day one. And when those are all healthy and clear, then they will allow them to collect the stool. They'll take it into the facility. They'll spin down all the poop components and just have left mostly the bacteria and the fungi, or most of the parts that we want. And they'll put those in a small collection in a freezer at minus 80. Why minus 80? Once you're down to minus 80 Celsius, virtually all bacterial growth quits, okay? It doesn't all quit at minus 20 or 40, which we have in the prairies outside in the winter, or you might have in your freezer, 
but it isn't until minus 80 that everything stops. You want it to get down there to stop because then they're not using up the energy around them. Okay? When we take them out and thaw them out, we try to give them a source of nutrition or energy again so that they can be doing well when they're implanted into the client. Okay? So before they release it out of the freezer where they put it for three months, they retest those people again. Because some viruses are slow growing. And that's the downside of most of the testing that happens in Canada and the United States. They just do the initial testing. Some of those people will have viruses which were just starting to grow at the time up. So you will miss them. And you will have the risk of transmitting from one person to another. In that sense, it's the safest place on the planet right now to have those. And by the end of fall, they'll probably be providing them directly to the National Health Service, which is, you know, their version of our Vancouver Island Health, or whatever the term is this week. It changes from time to time. Currently, most of the world, when they're treating C. difficile, and there's been over 200 people treated with C. difficile on Vancouver Island, you know, they will have either bought the donors from the U.S., or they may have a donor list, but they won't have had the double check, most of them. And they may not have the historical history of being healthy and slim. Why does slim matter? Well, there's some evidence from mice, and it's starting to turn up in humans. They're researching it now. Your bacteria may make you a captive and change things dramatically as far as your food absorption and the foods you crave and tend us towards being obese. Whereas if you take the bacteria from a healthy from a healthy, slim person, put it into that obese person, you may reverse the process. So we haven't battened our hatches yet. The research is happening mostly in the UK, but that might be one other reason that we're going to get really busy here. Currently, we get people up and down, mostly the West Coast, but there is people from as far as Tennessee and Montreal and Eastern points, New York, um, that will come because this doesn't happen in the United States because the FDA said several years ago, this is under review, and so far we can only let you use it in C. difficile patients who've had two years of failed antibiotic therapy. Well, if you're tied to your toilet at home, you maybe don't want to wait two years, but, you know, those things aside. So we would do them for that. Often five is almost 100% resolution of C. diff, and it doesn't take as much to reverse the C. diff as it does to help the whole microbiome replace. Okay, So those are kind of the steps that go at it while we work forward with it. Um, some of the main clients we've seen are multiple food sensitivities. Remember I talked about the leaky gut aggravating all that problem, and they may get a lot of foods back. I recommend strongly that they not do any gluten if they're going into this game, because gluten, new data has now shown at least a third of us, not one in 400, but a third of us have a problem with handling gluten and dairy at the gut lining wall. As a consequence, they increase our risk of depression, bipolar, and perhaps Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. That isn't everybody, I get that, but a third is a lot, okay? And we know now that if you take those out of the diet, so now you've got another way to potentially treat your depression, get off those, eat healthy food, big diversity, you may be good. You may be good to go. Long term, it isn't enough, get a GFT. That's not a GNT, it's a GFT. Okay? So I think that takes us most of the ways. Photobiomodulation. Thanks, dear. I've got a wife acting out what I've forgotten here. So the fourth item, I learned the other night I was in Calgary and I was overtired, so the last thing you want to do if you're giving a talk is say there's four things and then you get to number two and you can't remember what three and four are. That's not a good thing. So better if you kind of fudge and hedge it along. So the fourth major new item in the book is photobiomodulation, which this valley knows more about probably than anywhere in Canada or even perhaps the world because we have the major treatment center in Canada or United States right here in our same facility, Genoa Integrative Health, and it's under Josh and Crystal. Uh, they run the Genoa Laser Center. Center. So, and that's a huge tribute to Josh, because I asked him to go to a conference on cool laser or, or photobiomodulation 
about three and a half years ago. So he went to the conference and he got right into it. He went down to San Francisco, he bought a machine, and we literally have the best treatment system in Canada, easily. I think the Thor system is even better than the Bio, BioFlex, which is the one put together by the person on Dr. Norman Deutsch's book, The Brain's Way of Healing, which is a superb book. I mean, that's where I got the concept of photobiomodulation and light therapy. But I think the fellow that's put together this other group, the Thor programs, so we've got, you know, Josh and his team have two of these. They look like tanning beds. They go up and spend 20 minutes in them. It's Bill's favorite way of recovering from 18 holes of golf because I get stiff and sore and whatever. But if I have one of those on the way home, I feel like I've had a massage and a sauna and life is really good, okay? But we know now that that light therapy, and most of you have seen a similar light because you've seen it at the checkout counter at Home Depot or in your grocery store. It's not exactly the same, but it looks red, same as the other one. And that's why now there's more than 500 clinical double-blind controlled trials. You know all the saws that the docs use, okay? Trials proving that this works. And it works on a whole host of things, initially on all musculoskeletal pains. I've seen it have people cancel their knee surgery and their shoulder surgery, and rightly so. Because even though I was an anesthesiologist for a very long time, no surgery is a better way to go if you can manage it. Um, I know all my surgeon colleagues may have concern when I say that, but it's very true. Um, so, how does it work? Well, we know now that particular show frequencies of red and infrared light will penetrate between us. There's a lot more holes in us than we think there is. They aren't able to penetrate super deep, but they will, with the laser will penetrate two to three centimeters. Okay, that's pretty good. Whereas the infrared will only go part way. So these have been available in Canada for more than 20 years. In fact, in British Columbia, the physiotherapists have been credited to using lasers in their practice for more than 20 years. You know, I initially went up to one in Nanaimo when I heard about this, which had a fairly modest laser, but it was a start in the right direction. So what they have learned is that when these shine on the cell, they affect primarily the mitochondria. That's the little energy powerhouse of the cell that makes our energy in the cell. And when we have a chronic illness, often that's the part that shuts down. And that's why the chronic illness and fatigue are such close cousins, okay? As you can imagine, if you're not making enough energy in the cell, it's not working very well either. And so you can reverse that. What has happened in that chronic phase is that the cell's mitochondria has taken on nitric oxide and they're blocking the slots that the oxygen wants to fit into. Infrared releases the nitric oxide, which in good cases is your friend, and allows oxygen to come into the mix, okay? And so now the mitochondria work better, your cell works better. If the cell was an immune cell, now the immune system works better. So it all cascades on along from there. The other thing that we know it does, just as the hyperbaric oxygen does, it down-regulates the inflammation. So inflammation is all about pain anywhere in the body, or it's about the depression, it's about the cognitive problems, it's about the start of the vessel changes of Alzheimer's and everything else. So you can reverse components of that, and you can start your journey back to wellness, okay? And remember, it doesn't penetrate very far, and that's why if you shine it on bone marrow parts of the body, that would be the breastbone or the shin, the tibia, okay? Because that's a fairly superficial area down to the bone marrow, then it stimulates that bone marrow and releases again your own stem cells. So for maybe $2,500, you could do 20 treatments and boost those stem cells. The laser can't penetrate far enough to help an injured heart, you know, a heart attack. However, if you treat the tibia and the breastbone, it will release and those people will do better with their heart recovery, okay? So, We've now got several different tools to get you back on the journey to wellness. And we're happily, we're creating a, effectively a destination center here because you can do hyperbaric oxygen here, you can do the photobiomodulation or PBMT, and you can do the gut floral transplant. Or you can do two of the above or whatever. 
and happily people come. So one of your other questions might be, well, how can I get this paid for? At this time, the only part you might get paid for would be the photobiomodulation, because you see a talented, qualified physio, he or she recommends it, and now your Blue Cross may cover the cost of some of it, okay? We're several years, maybe decades, away from them covering some of the other things. Hyperbaric oxygen is covered when you go into the Vancouver General Hospital. They've got a 14-people unit. They'll take 14 at a time is what that means. They're in, under pressure. They're breathing oxygen usually on a mask, but sometimes on a hood. And they're doing that, and that's paid for by MSP, but they're very limited in what they will cover. In fact, when I spoke to the fellow who runs that center in Vancouver, he said, you should set it up for the island, and you could be under the medical services plan, and you could do all of the listed criteria that we can treat, and it would be paid for by the medical services plan. So I'm thinking, this is good. There's a, there's a but coming, and there was. So in that list of things, it's got ulcers on the legs. It's got post-radiation necrosis. It's got a whole list of things. It's got carbon monoxide poisoning and quite a list of features. The last two on the list, newest ones, are sudden hearing loss or sudden visual loss due to a, effectively a stroke in the eye. Okay? However, that was a but. If you use it for anything of the brain or anything on that list, we'll shut you down, meaning you can't do it anymore for the medical services plan. So I said, good, that's what I needed to know. I will not go under that draconian crazy option because no place needs it more than the brain does, whether that's chronic, or sorry, that's uh, traumatic brain injury, TBI or concussion, multiple concussions, or whether it's stroke, whether it's MS, whether it's a poorly healing leg, uh, and the list goes on and on of the different items that it helps dramatically. So um, I think that gets us quite a ways. I'm sure I forgot two or three things. The book has 36 chapters. It's uh, 475 pages. It's a 70-page concept of uh, index. That was one of the first critiques because it is it's a lot to chew into, and you can learn a lot in the table of contents, but it isn't everything. One of my favorite fans, and she organized a really good meeting, and Calgary last week, but her daughter, you know, and she'd read it, and this is a 15-year-old with MS, and did incredibly well, and she said, Bill, why didn't you talk about heavy metals? Well, I talked about heavy metals in the dental chapter and in a couple of other places in the book and the detoxification chapter, but because I didn't have an index, she didn't know that. So that's fine. Now people can go straight ahead and do that. One of my favorite things on the book was I sent it to my mentor and teacher, Andrew Weil, because I did the two-year integrative medicine training in Tucson, Arizona. It's mostly online, but you spend a week with your 80-member class in Tucson three times over those two years. And he called it a very comprehensive and well-researched book. That meant a great deal to me, and he was okay with putting it on the front cover. So he's been around even longer than I have. Even, and he has his summer home up in Cortez Island. You know, because it's a lot more pleasant up there in the summer, I think, than the superheated Tucson, Arizona. So I'm going to throw it for open for questions now. I have this very fit, suave-looking runner who's going to carry around the microphone. And uh, so you can ask your question, and this is your chance to play uh, Let's Stump the Doctor. I didn't say handsome, did I? Sorry. Go ahead, sir. I'm curious if there's any uh, studies or any work done on, on how this would impact somebody with Alzheimer's yeah. as well. I know AMS is, for a long time, you've been working with them and yeah. done a lot of good things, but I'm wondering what Alzheimer, if you have any impact on that. Yeah. So Alzheimer's is addressed in the book. It has its own chapter. There's three significant types of Alzheimer's, and this was written by Dr. Dale Bredesen, a UCLA neuroscientist researcher in Los Angeles, and his book was released, I think, last year, The End of Alzheimer's. How many of my colleagues have read it? Probably hardly any, sadly. He talks about three types of Alzheimer's. But if we back up a little bit, 20, 30 years before you get Alzheimer's is when the cascade's starting that it's going to happen in you. 
you get to change that. Because the first stage of Alzheimer's is vascular health deterioration. The vessels get smaller, and they get smaller over time, and you can change it. So just to make you an idea how graphic that is, if that tube represents my blood vessel, OK? And so now something happens. Maybe I've got inflammation and early atherosclerosis. But now that vessel is half the size, OK? Now the flow through that vessel is 1 16th. Because the physics law of flow, Poisson's law, shows that flow through a tube is related to the fourth power of the radius. So I didn't like that theory when I started anesthesia because I wanted to just put in a modest little intravenous. And if you needed a big tube, then it looked like a garden hose to me when you're putting in the big tube. But the flow increases dramatically. Fourth power of the radius. So you go from a little tiny tube to a big one, it matters. So let's go to the next stage because I haven't talked about microvasculature because I think it's the microvasculature which is a major injury in Alzheimer's. The same as it's major injury now in heart attacks. We've learned in the last few years that only 20% of our heart attacks are from that block in the blood vessels we look at all the time on angiogram. 20%. The other 80% are injuries at the microvasculature. Microvasculature, just to give you an idea of size, is blood vessels that are a half a micron to 100 microns. To give you a basis, the red blood cell is 7 microns, OK? But 100 microns is only 0.1 millimeters, OK? So if you think that we can surgically help something that small, get over it. Doesn't work, doesn't happen, OK? I don't know if I stepped on something here or what. I heard the click. So it's the microvasculature where the importance is in the brain and in the heart, and a lot of other tissues too. Because the good news is anything to help my blood vessel well-being and help my MS help my longevity and my aging speed too. Okay? I'm not over the fact that I'm going to age, but I'd like to do pretty well, quality of life, 100, 120, die. <laughs> I'm not into this life ended at 40 and slow downhill. Because we, we're in control of that. We get to change it, OK? So it's the well-being at the microvascular that you can change now for your Alzheimer's. So if you're getting the first significant changes of Alzheimer's, cognitive stuff, maybe you can't draw a clock very well. I mean, you can look at those three different formats to see which one will help you best. One of my favorite ones that gets totally missed all the time is measuring people's homocysteine. So that's a protein in the blood. We measure it all the time for heart attack risk. If somebody was a fit runner, super fit, doesn't smoke, of course, and has a heart attack, it's almost always a homocysteine excess. Okay? So the homocysteine can be lowered in the body, and you want it lower. If you will get it lower, down as low as 7 or 8, and the normal we accept here in the islands 12 or 13. But if you can get it down to 7 or 8, you cut your Alzheimer's risk in half. Lots of good research in the UK. We don't hear much about it in the United States because they don't like any research that wasn't done in America. But that's fine. We're pretty broad-minded, most of us Canadians. And we'll look at data out of Europe, especially out of the UK. But they've shown that irreversibly you can do that. How do you improve it? You take extra vitamin B6, B12 and methylfolate, or and some of you will get away with the cheap one, folic acid. Okay? But those are the little nuances that you can shift. If I was getting the early cognitive problems, I would do a series of 20 or maybe even 40 hyperbaric oxygen treatments, because that might make a significant difference. I would consider GFT, because the data is continuing to mount at the early stages. They're doing a major study on Alzheimer's out of Texas into the Bahamas. Of course, remember, they couldn't do it in the United States, but they went to the Bahamas, who get the implants from the same place we do. They've been doing it a couple extra years more. And if you want to get seen only by nurses and doctors, you can go there. It'll cost you twice as much, but that's your choice. But the weather's better, depending on the year. OK, but they are studying now the Alzheimer's issue as far as gut floral transplants, just as some of the early work is showing a big relative help in autism and other 
brain troubles, okay? And I would also consider the newest kid on the block. We have the only one in Canada here. Josh has a Genoa laser center, and that's the helmet with the lasers inside it. Looks a lot like a football helmet. John's tried it, I think. Many times. Yeah, I can spend 20 minutes in that, and I feel like I've had a cup of coffee, but I don't have the shakes or any gut issues, and uh, it's quite stunning what it does. We've had a huge response in a woman. She used it about a month. Terrible Parkinson's for several years, and now she's got her life back. Instead of stumbling into the room, she can dance into the room and talk a mile a minute, and speech was a problem before. Not everybody's going to get that dramatic response, but none of these things are nasty. They don't have any significant downside. So you need a lot less research behind something which has no downside. So think of all some of our chemotherapeutic drugs, and some of them are pretty risky for their downside. The other thing I want you to think about when you reach for any of those efforts, don't just do one, okay? Don't do one hyperbaric oxygen treatment. Andrew's got this idea now, if people just want to do one, he'll charge them $350 for it, because he discourages people doing that. Whereas you sign on for 10 or more, you're going to pay roughly 100. And the same with one photo biomodulation session. Probably not going to cut it. Most of you know that if you get two weeks' worth of antibiotics and you just take a single one, you're not going to get much better. Right? Makes sense. It takes a while to get into this mess. It's going to take a little while to get out of this mess and in the long term. So that's a kind of a long-winded answer, but it's a superb thing. I'm really into the dementia worries. Mom had it some, probably vascular dementia. But vascular dementia and Alzheimer's are very close cousins because, remember, Alzheimer's starts as a vascular problem. Okay? Not only that, I've got MS. I've had a brain injury, and so my risk of dementia is double. Okay? So I pay a lot of attention to these details for the simple same reason. I want to not have to give a talk with a name tag to remind me who I am. And I've given some, but likely I'm not there yet, looking down at the name tag. People come up and say, well, how come it's upside down? That's so I could see it. <laughs> anyway, I think that covers a lot of the Alzheimer's piece. You can do a great deal for your food. One other thing, most of our brain illnesses or problems are aggravated by toxins. And you guys all know that intuitively. So I was pretty lucky once I got rid of all the metal in my mouth in my early 40s after my diagnosis. And I think it was one of the ways to bring down my mercury partway because heavy metals are really hard on blood vessel health. So you get rid of them, or bring them down, your blood vessels get better. So it's each of those pieces as you work along that can make a difference to the long term. Other questions? The handsome guy's over here, but he'll come back. Come on back, John. I'm going to have to answer faster so you don't sit down. Oh, we got one here, and then we'll come to you, sir. Uh, you say you, you were at uh, Saskatchewan? Yeah, that's where. Yeah. Were you there at the same time as Abram Hoffer? I was. Uh, he came out here before I did. I knew him when he was there a little, and I knew him when he was out here, way ahead of his time. Brilliant guy. I know. He was my psychiatrist. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, he was doing experiments with the LSD that got shut down and similar to the can cannabis. Do you know that they're get going back yeah. now? I, I've been, oh, you've, you've heard about it. I do. I was just down in San Francisco three weekends okay. ago, and it was Integrative Mental Health Conference. So I'd had one five years before, organized by Andy Weil and the team, Integrative Medicine. And there's been 10, it's the 10th one this year for Integrative Medicine for Mental Health. Those are run by Great Plains Labs, and that's the one I speak at again. I've been at it five or six times. I speak at it in California, but I wanted, in San Diego. But I wanted to go down to see what Andy's update was, what things, and one of the big pieces on the program was, you know, psilobison, LSD, ketamine. Single dose of ketamine will often eliminate depression. I mean, it's pretty exciting stuff. And all the stuff that was taboo has now been proven, and it's creeping back into practice. And uh, actually, will, will, will the insurance companies, uh, health insurance companies, cover any of that stuff? That's, 
That's going to take a decade or more longer. Well, think about it. I mean, if you were a pharmaceutical company and had a new kid on the block, you'd do whatever you could to knock it down. That's who funds all these anti-vitamin things that come pop out occasionally because they're just absolute nonsense, but they've created it to make it look like it's a problem. So it's going to take a while to get paid for, but it's back on the map, and we're going to use it. And the place we may use it even sooner would be things like ayahuasca or ibogaine. Ibogaine is the one often a single dose will eliminate a narcotic addiction. That's a big deal, a narcotic addiction. Ibogaine. Yeah. Those are both South American herbs. Yeah. But it's coming. And it's back on the loop now. And there was some 900 psychiatrists at that meeting. Psychiatrists are ready to change and move. That doesn't mean every psychiatrist is ready to change and move. Well, the, some of them will change a lot faster than the neurologists, but that's my pet peeve, so I'm not going to go there. Change. Well, and most of them won't. <laughs> no, I completely agree, sir. It took me a long time, but I, I've been practicing medicine 40 years. I finally realized the only one I can change is me. So I'm here to give you some tools, but you get to do the change. You get to do the work. So this fellow had a question, and then we've got one over here. Okay, well, my question has to do with, uh, with gluten and glyphosate, and, and it's, also, it's often been suggested that it's not so much the gluten that is the problem as the glyphosate that's carried along yeah. with it, because it's been used to treat all the wheat that we uh, grow in Canada. Desiccated, yeah. And uh, the levels of it. So I'm happy to comment on that. Okay. It's one of my favorite pet peeves. I do it a fair bit in the book. So glyphosate, you will know, Roundup. It became a big deal about 1994. It was there before that. I grew up in a Saskatchewan prairie farm. Dad, we didn't have a lot of land. We had a quarter section. But I spent eight to nine trips on the summer follow with a 16-foot cultivator to try and control Canada thistle and couch grass or crabgrass. Okay? That revolutionized when we got Roundup. About that time, I left high school, university, and Dad didn't have many choices. He embraced the Roundup wholeheartedly. He probably paid his life because of it, because he got non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and died at 79. He was pretty healthy otherwise. So the Roundup has crept forward. At that time, and they were saying, and the New York eventually got called on it, that it was the safest table salt. In fact, one of my best buddies, a great Mennonite fellow that I've known forever, he was a crop science teacher at the time, and said, this is really safe stuff. They hoodwinked us. It's not safe stuff. It's not safe in any plant, okay? So we know that. It's not safe in any plant. But it's still not safe when your plants are eaten by your cows or your pigs or your chickens because we get remnants of the Roundup in us. Why are we plants? Well, same as plants are the bacteria within us. So every time you take glyphosate in, Roundup, you are taking in an antibiotic. Monsanto patented it as an antibiotic in 2003. They didn't tell many of us that. But every time you're eating one of those glyphosate containing foods, and a big one is gluten, because almost 90% of our wheat is desiccated before harvest, makes it a little quicker to harvest. It slightly increases the yield. You can see where this is going. But the downside is it concentrates in the seed. So you get the glyphosate with it. So you're asked, which one is worse? Well, it's a double whammy now, because the gluten has changed slightly, because we've bred careful selection most of the wheat. There is a GMO, but they kind of haven't got it out there too much yet, all right? But the gluten itself does that injury to the gut lining, and it's aggravated if you injure those healthy, friendly bacteria at the gut lining level, so you've got a double hit. You've got a double whammy. So the other important gluten, Glyphosate-containing foods, almost all potatoes, sweet potatoes, and all sugars, cane or beet, are harvested with Roundup. So those must be avoided. Why? Because I started in this story with toxins, okay? All of us can handle toxins pretty well. Little ones, like the little one back there, they can't handle toxins near as well because they're small and their liver's not as developed. What the glyphosate does, the Roundup does, 
is it shuts down the liver enzyme pathways in the gut. Shuts them down. Now you can't handle ordinary toxins. So the few toxins you were taking in and coping with, it can't deal with. Friends of mine, he's an anesthetist, she's a former nurse, and they measured their glyphosate. They were shocked. Theirs was, they were on the 70th percentile. I smugly said, mine's one to two, which is where I would like most of you to have it. So it's a matter of changing what you eat and finding out if that's there, and if you can't, then grow your own. I mean, we're blessed in the best part in the country for growing things, so if you grow your own, you're far and away ahead. At the same time, gluten pieces have changed some. 30 years ago, remember I've been in practice 40, 30 years ago, uh, celiac disease, which is a gut inflammation, huge problem, was one in 400. And then five years ago, it was one in 100. So that's a four times increase. And now it could be as high as 2 or 3%, all right? So it's going up and up and up. And at the same time, I, men I mentioned earlier, a third of us may not tolerate the gluten molecule, and it may sacrifice our health long term for a number of changes it creates in the body. So is one worse than the other? No, but they're a terrible double whammy together. Short story. Anybody want to buy a bread maker? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm told that the bread makers can do not too bad if you buy the ready-made flour, which has been through a whole host of different other grains in it. And they're getting pretty decent now. They sell it at the community farm store, and my wife's a much better expert than I am than at it. And over time, because I'm at it about 20 years now, I eat a lot less bread stuff. I can often get pastas, and we're blessed. Mostly around here, they will say, well, yeah, we got a gluten-free choice in there, or we can make it gluten-free. So... Things have come a long ways. Yes, sir. Could you comment, Could you comment on uh, the effects of an opioid patch for pain? Which patch? An opioid patch. Opioid patch. So the main one has been fentanyl patch. I think we've got some other patches now. But Duragesic was the first fentanyl patch, and we've had it for probably 30 years now. So opioids can work really well for pain. You know, I was nicknamed one of the fentanyl kids when I was training in the early 80s because if you used enough opioid during the anesthetic, you could wake people up with a smile despite their surgery. So that's quite an art form. So I was into that, you know, trying to make it right. The downside is in about the 90s, early 2000s, Purdue Frederick and then a few other pharmaceutical companies said, there's a gold mine here because we want to use it to treat chronic pain. And so they started many of us on that cascade and journey. And now we lose more people in the year in the United States than the entire Vietnam War due to the problem of uh, opioid overdose. A half to two thirds of all the opioid overdoses were started by a physician, unfortunately. So it has its place, especially at end of life with cancer or other places, and a few other selected places. But by itself, it's not a great pain reliever, especially for chronic neuropathic pain. My preference is a tiny amount of narcotic. And how do we get there? We use cannabis. Cannabis, in a modest dose, will increase the power of the narcotic you use, or opioid, by four to 10 times. So I can have a ripping headache, use some of the cannabis, use 15 milligrams of codeine, which is a half of a Tylenol-3, and I'm good. So it has its place. It's not the be-all, end-all it used to be, and it's hard on people, and sometimes it kills them. Thank you. Okay. There's one behind you, John. What do you think of uh, intermittent fasting? as a heating healing yeah. protocol. I think it's fantastic. I do. I aim for at least three times a week, and ideally it would be every day, to do a 12 or better yet 14 hour fast from the last time I ate. Doesn't sound super self-righteous when you break it out, because if I eat at 5.30, 6 o'clock, and I don't eat again till 8, I'm 14 hours, okay? So it seems to reset the body's metabolism in a much more useful way. And that brings down circulating glucose levels, circulating 
insulin levels and therefore circulating inflammation. So it can help you in your chronic healing and in many cases it helps you lose weight. I've had some people endorse it completely. They phone me up happy as a clam three to four months later because they've dropped 30, 40 pounds in that whole time. And it's been relatively effortless. Okay, so intermittent fasting is a very powerful tool. We need to use it more. Throw out the low-fat diet. That was only a disaster from the get-go. We still need fats. Just throw out all the trans fats. They're really bad. One of the new health foods, lard. <laughs> Question up here, John. You want to hand the mic forward? Oh, you got it. Yeah, hi. The way ahead. Okay. Um, would you recommend hyperbaric oxygen for healthy people as well and photobiomodulation as well? So would I recommend it for healthy people? Well, yes, I would. It depends how much you want to be at the top of your game and your quality of life. Because remember I told the story about Edward Teller? He was no dummy as an astrophysicist, but he used it six days a week and worked daily till he was 95. So that's how I want to go out with a thinking brain, knowing who I am and who I am, not being a burden on my family or loved ones, because none of us want that. Most of us, even if we're healthy, we get intermittent bouts of hassles. You know, we sprain an ankle, we injure something, or we get some other variation of away from optimal health. And there are great ways to go back because they work even better acutely. Yeah. And if you weren't sure which one to do, do both. And you will do zero harm, and you will likely dramatically improve your long-term aging speed. You may not live longer, but you could live a way better. Remember, you could be at the top of the game and then go suddenly, rather than creeping down. Yeah. So, no, they, they have a real place. And that... It's coming easier in photobiomodulation especially, and partly maybe because of the physio writing it, and then people can get it covered by Blue Cross. So it's a place to begin. And uh, now that we've got all those options locally, it's quite exciting. I have yeah. a concern. I have a family member who's chronically ill with many different illnesses, started out immune, autoimmune illnesses, the challenge is, for many people, is the financial challenge of ac accessing um, these wonderful yeah. tools. And if you're um, even middle class or poverty stricken, there's no, no way for that yeah. to happen. So, you know, yeah. I <laughs> wish that we could all be millionaires and we wouldn't have yeah. to. So I don't know, there's really no answer for that, but um, I don't know. It's no, it's a good question. And I thought about it a lot. I mean, almost 23 years ago, I thought we were going to lose our house and everything. It would end up in a small apartment in Duncan on welfare, despite my training or whatever else. Okay, Life can be hard. I can write thousands of dollars worth of prescriptions, but I can't write any supplements at all. And I can't write any of these. I'm not even a physiotherapist. I can't even write the photobiomodulation. But use the people, the pieces that we can use. Almost everyone can exercise. And if you can't exercise, you can, for almost next to nothing, you know, get access to one of these vibration machines. Because we use them in the Genoa Integrative Health Center. We use them out beside our hyperbaric oxygen treatment rooms. So oxygen, they can all do. Most of you can access some increased oxygen into your life by purchasing one of these oxygen concentrators for home use. You plug it into the wall into a 110 outlet and away you go. That might allow you to do exercise on it or it might allow you to lose it at night or if you're getting a migraine headache. The treatment in the UK now is sit down 30 minutes on that, you know, EWAT mask. So those are one-time purchases. Sometimes you're able to purchase one of those for as low as five or $600. You can purchase them brand new through um, longevity resources, they're in Sydney on the island, even without a medical prescription, because they sell them for use in ozone making, and they don't have a medical alarm, and that's why that variation. 
you can buy a brand new one for 2000 2200 a one-time cost, okay? It's an absolute drag. It's a disgusting part of the system that many of the parts that are covered, I mean, we're about to put in a, maybe a national pharmacare. I mean, I lived in Saskatchewan early on, and they were the first in the world. They had a million people, their favorite place for Harvard and everybody else to study, because they had a, a million people on a drug plan in a major way. Did help, that help dramatically the health of the people in Saskatchewan? Well, actually, no. I don't think it did. It made it so that my sister-in-law, who lives there, I talked about other ways that she could reduce her heartburn, and sometimes with herbs or choices, but she'd have to pay for the supplement. She said, no, no, I'll take my drug plan covered protein pump inhibitor. Thank you very much. But most of those drugs have a downside to them. And I'm pretty explicit in the book. I'm not friendly on statins or pr protein pump inhibitors or other things. I am on big on LDN, low-dose naltrexone which is actually a very weak narcotic antagonist, but has some powerful benefits to the body. So that's a problem. But it's, to some degree, always been thus, tragically. The one upside I have for you is access to these isn't governed by a physician. So you don't have to wait a year to see your gastroenterologist and hope that they will recommend this treatment for you, or to see your neurologist who's even less likely to recommend it, whatever it might be of those three or four things. But the one thing you can do here is you can work with cannabis more often. And that's one option that people tend to have more of. But the other option is to try and get their ducks in a row, do the pieces that they can. And I thought lots about this because I know people on welfare can't afford organic. But they can simply look at inside the book at the dirty dozen and get those organic or grow them yourself or don't eat them, okay? And then pick other choices that you can either grow yourself or find all those features. And that's why I put a chapter on gardening in the book. The other wonderful thing about gardening is it's a tremendous metaphor because it's almost exactly as the health and well-being of your gut microbiome is the same as having super healthy soil. And they're tied immeasurably to the production and growth of those vegetables or fruits. So it's not a good answer, but it's as best I can because I've, I've seen many people with MS. Most of them are able to do it on their others. I mean, if we could take that 30000 that they spend on one year of MS drugs and put it into the patient's other use, you'd have all those things and some left over. I mean, that's the critical mass. That's the hassle. It's going to be a challenge to get there. But we can vote with our own personal feet. So we've got back there. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, thank you very much, Bill. Great information. Uh, you talked about dopamine and tied it with Parkinson's to a certain degree. Would you talk a little bit more about that in the gut? I have a friend with Parkinson's, and I'd really like to help them out with that. So Parkinson's probably starts in our gut. Almost all people with Parkinson's, 15 years or so before they're diagnosed, they're terribly constipated. Why? There's a particular group of, or groups of bacteria that are much higher in those people with Parkinson's in their gut. So consequently, those injure the motor neurons because going through the gut tube, there's a whole series of motor neurons on the outside edge. This creates so-called peristalsis or movement rippling through. So everything moves from here down to the bottom, okay? It doesn't do it just by gravity, okay? Or philosophers could solve it. But as it injures those motor neurons, they quit working. The other piece I didn't get to, but I talk about in the book, is the superhighway, okay? So as an anesthetist, I was really into optimal function of the vagus nerve for my benefit, okay? So if a child's heart rate is slowing down and down and down, because they're very heart rate dependent, you can't increase the stroke volume in a baby or a child, but you can in an adult. So in them, you've got to keep the heart rate up. So you give some anti-vagal stuff, atropine in this case, and it brings up the heart rate. In reality, what I didn't know was that this traffic from the brain to the gut and the heart and all those tissues by the vagus nerve is only 10% from above down. 90% of it is traffic and information from the bottom up to the brain. It's also the superhighway 
that these bacteria that triggered the Parkinson's travel up to the brain. The Scandinavians did a brilliant study a few years ago. They looked at all these people that had a vague old nerve cut. And it used to be our treatment for ulcers. They got me in pyloroplasty. That's a long name for you. It meant they did a mini bypass of the stomach, and they cut the vagus nerves. That reduced the acid production, and then we got some very fancy drugs, which shouldn't be used any more than three months, but we use them for life. Anyway, so then if you look at those people, they have half the risk of Parkinson's as the others. Now, I'm not advocating that people get their vagus nerve cut to prevent their Parkinson's, and it won't treat it, because the cat's already in the barn, so to speak, or out of the barn in the Parkinson's case. But those would be the parallels that give us the indication, get the gut healthy, keep the gut healthy, you'll be better off. The other secondary corollary of that, a big piece of Parkinson's is toxins. It's a lot more common in farmers. Farmers eat bad? Not necessarily, but they're around a huge amount of sprays. And those are nasty toxins. So remember the other th piece that you gleaned today from me, how can I keep my toxin getting reduced ability really high? Get rid of the glyphosate, because it shut down the toxin ability of my liver to handle it. So all of these things are taking us downhill in a handbasket, but if we reverse them, you'll do well. So the other corollary was put together by an independent layperson in South Africa, John Pepper. So he was in uh, Norman Deutsch's The Brain's Way of Healing book too. I mean, I've got a lot of respect for these people because they brought new ideas out. He shows and has shown irreversibly himself and in quite a few others, if those Parkinson's people will walk purposefully five miles, three times a week, they can usually get off their Parkinson drugs. Almost all of us can afford that. Now, you might need something to help jumpstart you if you can barely move now with your Parkinson's, but I've tried to give you other choices that would help you start on that path. The newest thing, and I just learned this a couple of weekends ago from the guy at Great Plains, because I have tremendous consideration for Bill Shaw, who runs that lab. They have recently found the gene that shows why autism is more common in boys. It's a sex-linked gene, so it's more common in boys if only have one X chromosome. At the same time, he told us that the enzyme pathway that moves dopamine over to norepinephrine or noradrenaline is affected. He can now measure it. I just did one the other day and it's right in the guy's boots. So if you don't have enough of that enzyme pathway, you're stuck with too much dopamine. And remember, and you're already thinking, dopamine's good for Parkinson's. Well, it's not completely good for Parkinson's. Dopamine in the gut area can't get into the brain. It doesn't cross the blood-brain barrier well. That's why we give L-DOPA, which is a precursor, and then it can make dopamine in the brain. The other thing for brain healthiness and happiness and well-being is having enough of noradrenaline or norepinephrine. And if you're blocked with getting your dopamine over to norepinephrine, it doesn't work. What blocks that pathway? Some of the wrong bacteria in the gut. Clostridia is one of them, big ones. C. diff and C. botulinum and so on. But the other thing that blocks that pathway in a third of us is excess gluten in casein or dairy. Okay? So just as I said, that will help some people with their, park, their depression. It will help some people, likely, with their brain. Lots of evidence now. If you can eliminate dairy, your Parkinson's will improve. Okay? Pain in the neck? Yeah. You can't do a double-double, you'll have to do something different. But, you know, you can get by with it. So those are all nuances, and I expect now in Japan, when they treat it, they use a drug which we call here Northera, or Droxydopa, which helps that pathway, enzyme pathway, work better. So that's common in Japan. I think it's available here. I haven't put anybody on it yet. I think it's extremely dear, unfortunately. Yeah, but we get to control it ourselves by a healthy gut, get rid of the dairy. If I had Parkinson's, I'd eliminate dairy, and I didn't get there quickly because I love my ice cream, but I'm off dairy now. But I still eat butter. Yes. Oh, just a sec. Can we get there? There's one over here. 
Faster, faster, handsome man. <laughs> Hi there, thank you. Um, can you talk a little bit about fibromyalgia and if um, any of what you've been speaking to today would be of support to that? Sure. So fibromyalgia is certainly an energy problem illness in the first place, okay? So I alluded a little bit early to the mitochondria. That's the energy-making part of the cell, okay? And if you think about that, it'll start to get you where I'm going with this. People with fibromyalgia and chronic fatigue both have dysfunction or lack of optimal function of their mitochondria. So how might you reverse that? Sometimes you can do it with supplements, and I put a whole chapter on energy recovery through supplements. My big favorite three was taught to me by a brilliant cardiologist out of Tennessee at a meeting in Boston, and he's got four people off the heart transplant list. So that's a big change. They're out of heart failure, they're off the transplant list by using coenzyme Q10 200 three times a day, L-carnitine, um, 500 milligrams three times a day, and a five-sided sugar called D-ribose, five grams once a day. That might be enough to start it. If it isn't, because the other part that happens in fibromyalgia is you have a problem with clearing the inflamed regions in those muscles or fascial tissues. And that's why you get your classic trigger points of pain that are part of the diagnosis, right? But at the same time, if you can improve the function of the mitochondria, often those start to clear up and the inflammation reduces too. So we know that there's two things of what I've talked about today that will reverse fibromyalgia quite well with 20 treatments. One is the photobiomodulation and the other is hyperbaric oxygen. 20 treatments and then, you know, you'll be a believer, you'll probably get almost all your features back. Because it's, a, it's like MS. It's mostly in women, it's mostly in their, you know, peak years of 20s, 40s, and so on. But it's mostly reversible. And none of the drugs that we use to treat it, or try and treat it, work. So if we focus on those other pieces, and most people know that if they do exercises, they will do better with their fibromyalgia. But I was there with my MS. I was so bad I could barely get out of bed some days. Talking about walking a block, yeah, get over it. I'm not interested because I can't do it. But if you can get up that first plateau or first step, and then you can do it, then you can get there. I see one of my friends nodding her head because I think she's been through some of those journeys. So those are the places I would go, but I'd get that diet better first. Because you've got to do all you can to put healthy stuff in here because some of those triggered your problem in the first place, tragically. And sometimes an injury helped trigger it. Okay, because an injury can blow the cart off its wheels. And now you've got a focal peri part of the body that has become either a chronic pain problem or a chronic inflammation trigger pattern, and you're hooped. But if you can reverse that, you may reverse the chronic illness. And MS is not supposed to be reversed. I've been called um, intermittent MS, and then I've been called secondary MS, I went down to see a wizard in California which really frosted my neurologist in Vancouver, I can tell you. Why can't we have somebody here assess you for the insurance company? Anyway, I saw him down there and, and he said, well, Bill, you've got primary MS, which is the very worst kind to have, of course. Uh, and I said, well, why is that? Well, it'll be all the things that you've told me about, you didn't tell your physician about. So they didn't happen. I was like, cool, that's good. So now, because I'm so much better and I see some very top name neurologist, Weinstock, Goodman, in Buffalo, New York, and different places, but they say I have relapsing, remitting, or intermittent MS, because by their definition, I can't get better from the other one. And that's just nonsense, because you can reverse a lot of brain problems. Am I brand new? No. Do I have a normal bladder? No. Just ask Denise. We drove a long ways in a car together. But, you know, I'm better than I was. these treatments help you quicker than somebody that's had it for a long time? Because I've got two children. Younger is always better. Younger is always better because we're not as dyed in the wool with the major changes. Okay. 
If you give me someone at the end stage of Alzheimer's or end stage of MS, we're pretty much hooped because there's too much damage, too much scarring has occurred. Earlier is always better. But, but you'll see the response is faster. I mean, if there's any reason people do pediatrics, yeah, kids get really sick, but they get really well quickly when they get well, which is very rewarding, and, and youth is on our sides. It's a tragic thing, it's spoiled on the young. Question? Wow. Um, you touched on many things today. There was one item that you just touched on. I think, Gladys, you brought it up, intermittent fasting. And I can say, for one year, I did do intermittent fasting, and it doesn't cost anything. It's one of those things that you can do it, and it, yes. I was just thinking when, you know, how can we afford these things? Well, sometimes you give up a holiday, and yeah. you go and you sit in the chamber instead. But the intermittent fasting for one year, uh, yes, I had worked up myself up to 18 hours of fasting, and it wasn't three times a week, it was more than that. Mm -hmm. And it does work, and it helps your brain, it helps your joints, it helps everything, and then you can do that next phase where, oh, I wanna go out and walk. Yeah. So. No, so, and it makes an extremely good point, so thanks for reiterating and bringing it up. What we didn't talk about, because number three type of Alzheimer's, one of the nicknames for that type of Alzheimer's is diabetes type three. Okay, you've all heard about type 1, that's when you get as a kid, it's a, like an autoimmune illness, or you get it middle age, or sometimes kids in their teens, tragically now, quite overweight, and now they've got type 2 diabetes. Type 3 is insulin resistance, unable to get glucose into the brain cells, and therefore Alzheimer's. These people, some of them will respond dramatically to medium chain triglycerides and coconut oil, because that will now enter the brain and act as a secondary fuel mechanism. But what it tells us all along the road, and I maybe didn't emphasize it enough, you do a sugar spike or a super carb spike, you know, a couple slices of bread, they're even worse than four teaspoons of sugar, okay? And you get an insulin spike, and you get an inflammation spike. So if you're trying to reverse any illness virtually at all, you want to tone down the inflammation. Yeah, we need parts of it in the get-go when we injure that or whatever, but we don't want it over the moon and we don't want it persistent. It can't even remember why it started because the vicious cycle starts and it keeps going. But if you can break the cycle one way and well stated because it's something in everyone's control. Yes? Is uh, HGH beneficial for healthy aging? HGH? Uh, human growth human hormone. hormone. Yeah, thank you. I don't always get the nuances. I have my bionic hearing aids. My wife thanked me and my kids thanked me and I wasn't sure if I should get them or not, but I was glad I did. Anyway, but human growth hormones is, is, is helpful. So let's just spend a moment on hormones because early on in my integrative medicine journey, I, I set up, I'm not sure I'm ever really gonna get really good at doing you know, intermittent hormone treatment for people, especially for women postmenopausal or for men with testosterone and all these other nuances. But a very wise pharmacist She's probably the same age I was, but she'd been to many, many of these courses in the United States. And she said, Bill, get the gut healthy, and then you just need a dusting of any of the hormones. So you need much less. So anything you do to increase your general well-being will improve your human growth hormone. Now, I've got a son that lives in Costa Rica. He's got a few friends who want to be live forever, so their solution is they take injections of human growth hormone. It's pretty tricky to do here. You got to have a special diagnosis as a kid, and then you can get it, and it, it's even paid for. But mostly, if you keep your entire body healthy, then the body component that makes the human growth hormone is also well, and it stays up better longer. So that's probably as close as I can come, because it is one of the parts of longer healthy aging, is maintaining your levels of human growth hormone. But so is testosterone, and so is estrogen in its regular format. Yeah. So we need to get the microphone. You already have it? Oh, no, you don't. The handsome man's bringing it. Um, the oxygen, the home use oxygen generator you suggested, yeah. mm -hmm. do you have a brand name for it? Well, I gave you the name of the people that supply it down in Sydney on the island. 
and they supply it to Canada, the United States. Longevity resources. You can find it online. They used to take off 10% if you mentioned Dr. Code, so I wouldn't swear to that. I mean, they said, well, I could send you 10%. No, I said, give it to the client. Well, and they ship all the way to Toronto. That's the good news. Yeah. And I have no vested interest in that. The I longevity don't. part, like I, I, I no affiliation. Oh, oh, longevity, John. <laughs> Yet they didn't ask you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and to that point, I would like to bring up, as we end the day, is that uh, since I was diagnosed, I took on twenty uh, treatments right away of the hyperbaric oxygen, and I noticed a difference. And I'm up to fifty-five or fifty-six right now, and I can tell you, when I get to the bottom of Gibbons Road and I start going up the hill, my nostrils start to flare. I start to breathe better. I start getting excited about where I'm going. <laughs> It's a wonderful thing that starts happening. I've tried the helmet. There's a fog that comes with MS. We don't, it's a fog, it's hard to explain, but it, you know what it's like when you do the helmet and you come out and the fog's not there. That's how you can define what the fog is. Yeah. There's a clarity that exists. Um, I have a cyst on the side of my, underneath all this hair on my left hand beard, uh, there's a cyst which we've been able to take down quite dramatically by using um, the laser therapy, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so all these little things I've been able to try because I started worrying as well. Once I, you know, I was, when I first found out about the MS, I was devastated. I did not know what was coming up. But by following some of the roots, some of the plans that have been put in front of me and some of the ideas that you can work with, the one I have to work on is the exercise. But again, I understand it's that first move. Any of the things I've done, I would not have done if I had not taken that first step and said, okay, let's go do that it becomes a habit. I'm looking forward to, to the walking. I'm looking forward to those things and realizing today that you do, sometimes there is a plateau that you've got to get up to. Mm -hmm. There is that, imper that thing inside of you, you've got to make that decision. Yeah. And then you will find answers. No, you bring up a good point and, and our long-term knowledge has been greatly increased because Dr. James, Professor James started, there's 60 charitably run hyperbaric oxygen treatment units in the UK. So people put in 20 pounds or they put in nothing, whatever they can afford. I don't think I'm going to live long enough to get them all established in Canada at that same concept. But the other piece that's changed is the home oxygen option, which we now have. I don't think it's as good, but it's sure a way better than nothing. But okay? sir, you have 60 more years. <laughs> that's right. Maybe. Depends how much the energy holds out. Um, but the other piece that goes within that is to keep those optimized, because these they've done three and a half million treatments in the UK on people with MS in these last 30, 40 years. But they've learned if people will do once a week after that initial 20 or 40, once a week, their MS usually stays right stable rock. It doesn't get worse. And the other thing that verifies that is two centers, one in London and one in Newcastle on time, did studies on the bladder. Because you can do studies on the bladder that I mean, you just can't fake, because these are studies of pressure, differences within the bladder function, which are objective and very repeatable. And that confirmed, if you do once a week, you can maintain well-being. So that's, and if you get into a hiccup, then you do a few extra. And if you're stupid and go in an airplane a lot, go in a little extra. Well, I, I, I did take an airplane just recently and found out when I came back and I mentioned to you what had happened and to uh, Andrew. He says, oh, take oxygen on it. And then that's when I realized when getting on the plane, what actually happens. Yeah. You know, I was devastated when I got off the plane. I was just a, a physical mess and then realizing yeah. what had caused it. And again, You're a I'm, not, I'm not saying that I have found any cures for everything I'm doing, but I found out ways to manage. Yeah. And that's basically what all these units are doing. They're helping me manage with what well, I Well, helping you manage. Because that's what life's about, isn't it? We learn to manage, we're on a journey. Will we slip out sometimes? Sure we will, okay? But you know, get back on your bus, whether it's supplements or it's auction, whatever you need, then you can usually get back. Don't screw it up too badly too often, or you might not get back on the bus. But that's fair enough. So here? Uh, what we constitutes a healthy gut? Like how can you tell if your gut's healthy or not? So, so can you repeat it, okay, please? Okay, what constitutes a healthy gut? How can you tell if your gut's healthy? Okay, well, you know, the short-term quick things are, do you have diarrhea or constipation? Okay, so that's one clue. Another one is, do you get heartburn after you eat or sometime after you eat? Or do you get a bulging or a bloating after eating and you feel unwell? So those are all clues about the gut well-being. 
It doesn't give you details about which group of bacteria are there, and the science isn't there yet to, you need more of this bacteria. It's not even close. In fact, it's the individual variability among us that means that we should be taking a generalized. And that's why I was happy when I had those gut floral transplant treatments, I had 12 different donors. Because I didn't know which ones were better for me, and neither did the person giving them. But my body is pretty clever. It sorts them out. And so even I might felt like crap on day four after that particular implant, it might have been just because that really one I really needed was fighting with the old timers, you know, to establish a new depot. So each of these are clues. Almost every brain issue is affected by the gut. And I mentioned before, 400 autoimmune diseases, all due to the gut breaking down. Okay, there's a guy named Hippocrates. You've probably heard of him. We didn't actually do a Hippocratic oath, but you know, that, that doesn't surprise me either. He said 100% of disease of his time begins in the gut. So he had it pegged a long time ago. And we've had a lot of wisdom over the years. The Egyptians had quite a bit of information about the gut and how to keep it well and so on, and that we needed sunshine for vitamin D. And you know, some of these earlier civilizations had a lot of pieces right, and we dispelled it all in the name of science, which is just nonsense, but that's the way it goes. So those are all clues. So if you have none of those, and you don't have any aches and pains when you get up or down, maybe you've got a healthy gut. But if none of those are quite right, start with the gut. Anybody else? Over here? One there and then over here on the couch. Yeah, you, you were talking about, or the fellow down there was talking about the human growth hormones. And I'm, I'm taking some of those, but in the form of uh, DHEA and a mm -hmm. combination of DHEA and Soma Life. Are you familiar with those? What was the second one? Soma Life. Yes. Yeah, okay. they, they come yep. out of uh, Kelowna, yep. actually, but you can combine sure. those two. Yep. That's, uh, that's an, excellent, an excellent way to handle that. But the HEA you can't get in Canada unless you have some sort of a prescription. Or I don't think you can even get it, but uh, it's down in the yeah. States where you can get it. Yeah. So DHEA-S, we can measure that here in Canada. So we can give you an idea of what yours measures at. It's not going to be a common thing that your doc's going to measure for you. I, I measure it whenever people are asking about their hormone issues and so on. And for some years, I brought it up from, with me for personal use from the U.S., because that's the only way to get it here. You can get a prescription, but it's tricky to find somebody to write it for you, right. and it won't yeah. be inexpensive. But you mentioned a good point with the, the Soma Life and, and the other, is that many supplements will help some of us, but supplements won't necessarily help all of us. So my short-term recommendation is, if you can afford the supplement, take it for three months and see if it makes a difference. And if you're not sure at three months, stop it. And if you feel crappy again, go back on it. Because one advantage we've got with a chronic illness, it's not like we've got to get it better in a week or two, even though we'd like to. We've got time to fix it. Okay? I've been on this 22 and a half years. So specific ones, I've got a whole major chapter. I've got a whole major chapter on supplements in the book. There's a lot of nuances, but most of them are pretty inexpensive. Boron, for example, can really back off osteoarthritis. Now there's one available at the health food store. You don't have to create it out of your own borax. So three milligrams a day will probably reduce those risk factors. Yeah. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, yeah, I'd like to ask you uh, something about H. pylori. Are you familiar with that? Yes. And uh, I know it's a bacteria that's uh, it's actually insidious uh, to try to get rid of, but. Uh, could you give me some more idea about that? Some yeah, so ideas? H. pylori is caused by a particular bacteria, Heliobacter, yeah, okay? Heliobacter pylori, that's what the H stands for. And the overgrowth has been related to causing the problem with heartburn or indigestion okay. in a major way and formation of ulcers. Also, Proven by two Australian GPs, okay? Who eventually got a Nobel Prize, but everybody thought they were very crazy for a long time, and the one finally gave it to himself, he infected himself with H. pylori, improved, and then the ball started rolling, okay? But it's the classic example now to how long does it take to change? 
It takes nearly 20 years for even a very good idea to change. H. pylori has probably been oversimplified. If you had me treat H. pylori in myself now, I probably wouldn't necessarily treat it with the antibiotic blunderbuss that they do. No, no, I would think about other techniques to change it, because it's probably part of the useful part of the team, just not in over-domination. But in the short term, at least we're treating with antibiotics, and I would recommend highly, anytime you take antibiotics, take probiotics with them, right from the get-go. Don't just say it's a waste of money, because antibiotics will kill it anyway. It's not that simple. It will help protect some of your bacteria relatively. Yeah, I tried it with uh, uh, twice now, with, uh, but I, I found some, you know, with antibiotics, but I found some other supplements that are called Mastica, which comes off yeah. a tree or somewhere in Greece yeah. or something Yeah, it's like an herbal, herbal and, mixture. Oh, thank you. And uh, another one is, um, it's called Matula tea, which I found out about. It comes out of South Africa. Yeah. And they know about... So there's lots of herbs on the yeah, planet. Those, yeah, exactly. And people will use herbs. Often they'll use herbs successfully for gut problems, even C. diff, or the gut problems of autism, or maybe the gut problems of SIBO, small intestine bacterial overgrowth, relatively new in the medical community here. In fact, I'm not sure they've all even heard about it, but it's a very big deal. Um, the very common diagnosis of um, gut dysfunction. Help me out, Denise. Irritable, irritable bowel, bowel syndrome. syndrome. Thank you. Almost everybody with irritable bowel syndrome has SIBO, small intestine bacterial overgrowth. Different treatment. A few of them will have back fungal overgrowth, both treatable. Okay. And there's a powerful association between irritable bowel syndrome and MS. 70% of people with MS have irritable bowel syndrome, okay? So there's a huge gut tie-in all across the board. Thank you. Yes? Hi there, my question was about H. pylori, but I was thinking about this oxygen piggybacking on hemoglobin. What if you have low hemoglobin? Okay, well, low hemoglobin, then extra oxygen is even more of a critical item. In fact, they showed in, the, I think, the 1800s, a Frenchman put pigs in the hyperbaric chamber, bled them out completely, so no hemoglobin left, and they stay alive. And it's the same as the treatment for a JW person, if you can buy time and so they can make their own hemoglobin and so on. Hemoglobin's still really, really important, okay, and low hemoglobin is anemia and it's got problems, but what does it give you? It gives you all the symptoms of low oxygen fuzzy thinking, fatigue, because those are all the same. And that's why it comes out the same. But before leaving that, you can have too much hemoglobin, so-called hemochromatosis, moderately common, often missed. That's why I talk about it in the book. Don't miss these big ones, docs, because it's a lot of grief for a long time, and it may be irreversible by the time you figure it out. So, Low hemoglobin is important to treat, but often you can peel back the layers of the onion and figure out what the issue was that triggered the low hemoglobin. Anybody in our age group, you better make really, really sure you don't have a cancer in a large bowel starting it. Because that's, that's missed, even now, and there's no reason on earth that it should be. What are we doing for time? Well, what I'm just looking at is at the time it's quarter after three, and I just oh, want to say this is the book that he's been talking about, and it's over here. And if there's any private questions or people would like to ask us as he's getting up to it, I think we should call it a day. It's been a long time. Yeah, no, it's been great. And I'd like to thank Dr. Bill Cote for coming in. I'm glad to see the number of people that came out yeah. on Mother's Day because it is a topic. And, and one of the things we do have to realize is we are sitting in the, in the center of the universe when it comes to integrative medicine. And we should be really taking advantage of it in this community. I would not have these possibilities anywhere else. Yeah, thank you. So we're happy to we can sell you the books. What you can get today, you usually can't get, is you can get a signature on the book. The book's $30. That's the same as at volume one, although you may have to, you know, be fortunate to have them in. If I have to mail it to you, tragically, even if I just mail it to Nanaimo, it costs me $15. So that's a lot, very expensive book by the time you do those other pieces. You can buy it online. You can buy it on Amazon. You're going to pay more than you will here today, $30, and you'll pay a lot more for the hardcover. It's just the way, the vagaries of how to do it. My goal with the book is not to make money on it, 
to get it into many people's hands, and then you'll show it to your friend, show it to their friend. Thanks very much for coming, folks. <laughs>